Thank you for that nice introduction. It usually takes me about two or three sentences to overcome those fine introductions, and people find out that one I like, and they start sleeping, so I hope that doesn't happen today. Um, it's a little challenge, challenging to be here from the U.S. Uh, Americans have a certain reputation for knowing everything and asserting their dominance and control and so forth, and that would be a disaster here because this field is rapidly developing. I don't think anybody has all the answers. I'm going to suggest to you things that are going on in the United States, and you should decide whether you like it or not. So there's no implication of what I'm saying to you that this is the way you do it. We figured it all out in the United States, and if you just do it like we do it, everything will be fine and your programs will be perfect now and forever. Uh, that's not what will happen. So I'll just make that, let's start with that uh, very clear. Um, all right, I first want to talk about Peter Rossi. I'm at a disadvantage here again because none of you know Peter Rossi, but he's an amazing guy, very, very famous in the U.S. One of the first, he's one of the real founders of evaluation research. And as you'll see throughout this presentation, I think evaluation is really the fundamental, one of the fundamental, if not the fundamental, building block of an evidence-based approach. And in, uh, in 1987, Peter Rossi wrote an article called The Metallic Laws of Evidence and uh, Evaluation. And the iron law, the very first one, is the expected value of any net impact assessment of any large-scale social program is zero. That was really controversial uh, because people thought that our programs were great and we're having all kinds of impacts. We're solving all kinds of problems and we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars, literally. We now spend about a trillion uh, between the federal government and the states on our social programs. And of course, they're having major impacts all over the country. And along comes Rossi, arguably the most impressive evaluator in the United States, saying, okay, I've looked at the literature. We have lots of studies. Most things don't work. So it was a real challenge to the field. And Rossi survived, uh, although he got a lot of criticism for that. And you know what I think happened eventually? is that most American uh, evaluators and people who are focused on programs thought he was right, that most of our programs did not work. Probably the representative example and the most dramatic is Head Start. Everybody knew Head Start worked. Even those rascal Republicans thought that Head Start worked. Uh, and so uh, Congress eventually got tired of all the arguments, and so they called for a national evaluation of Head Start, spent a lot of money, National representative sample from a number of sites around the country done by a very good research firm called Westat. And the results showed that Head Start had immediate impacts at the end of the program. If you measure the kids at the end of the program, they do pretty well. You come back a year later, two years later, three years later, there are no differences. So this is a pretty weak set of evidence to build a program on and to make all these claims about Head Start solving poverty and changing the course of development of children. And I think it was pretty difficult after that to claim that Head Start did change the course of a child's development. Uh, and I only cite that as an example that a lot of things that we assume are true, and especially, especially that policymakers assume are true, are at least questionable, if not out and out wrong. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do. Now, we have done some of this work. I've listed a series of programs up here uh, that we now have very solid evidence based on very good, almost all random assignment studies here, which most people think are the best. I'll come back and talk about that because it's a fighting words to say random assignment is the only way to establish the truth and whether programs work. But this very impressive list of programs, and I could, have, I could triple it or quadruple it. We, I would estimate we have maybe something on the order of 100 specific approaches to policy problems like teen pregnancy, delinquency, development during the preschool years, and mental health, uh, child abuse and neglect. And we have many programs that we have very strong evidence that they work. Now I'll come back to this later. We don't have strong evidence that we can mount it in a thousand different places with a lot of different kind of people and a lot of issues and have that kind of impact. But in specific places with specific people, I'd say we have maybe on the order of 70 or 80 to 100 model programs that we know have been shown by very strong research 
to have impacts. So they directly violate uh, Rossi's law, unless you focus on the widespread uh, scale of Rossi's law, that might still be true. But we know a lot about intervention. We are able to intervene in a lot of issues and have serious impacts. A very good example of this, it's not only attributable to programs, but I think this is a hint about how we have to think about social problems, is in teen pregnancy. In my view, teen pregnancy is a disaster. And there's a ton of research. I don't know anybody that dis disagrees with that. It's a huge problem in the United States. It's bad for the mother. It's bad for the baby. It's bad for the family. It's bad for the community. And it's bad for our whole society. And we spend billions of dollars on babies that are born to mothers who are still very young and unintended. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. And do you know that since 1991, in every single year except two, teen pregnancy has declined in the United States. And over that period, teen pregnancy has declined, declined 60%. 60%. I don't think we have any other social problem that we can claim that kind of success for. If we had that success in poverty reduction, in school achievement among kids from low-income families, it would really be a triumph. And the teen pregnancy reduction is a triumph. But we don't have very many of those. And I think we need to study that more. I don't know how the lessons would apply in New Zealand. But in the United States, there are at least two lessons that I think are clear. One is definitely clear, and one is a little cloudier, but I think it's an important part of the picture. And the, the lesson that is very clear is that we have a lot of model programs that have impacts on teen sexual activity and even reducing pregnancy rates. Uh, according to HHS, we have 35 programs like that that have strong evidence of success that they will reduce teen sexual activity, they will increase the use uh, of condoms and other methods of birth control, especially something called LARC's long-acting reversible contraception, which is almost a foolproof method of reducing pregnancy for women who don't want to have a baby. Uh, and so those programs are a crucial part of the national strategy, and it's being pursued now. Uh, I'll come to this in a few minutes, that Obama saw the wisdom of having this approach, and he's instituted a, a, a much more widespread systematic program that I think is the key for the future. The second thing here that is much harder to measure, and I think, but I think it plays a really important role, and that is the values. The values about teen pregnancy. We have virtually no dispute in the United States. There is no serious voice that says teen pregnancy is a good idea. In fact, parents, teachers, principals, all school administrators, ministers, and even the kids themselves, which this is shown very clearly in the survey, think it's a bad idea to have a baby. So we have the agreement between the values involved and what people think we should do, and we have lots of ways that we have, have been shown by good research to work. If we meet those two conditions, we can solve a lot of social problems. And we have problems in both areas, I think, but well, I'll come back to that. Um, so Rossi's law is no longer correct. I think almost no one would argue that it's correct. Uh, and now it's for us to figure out better ways to do it. I want to mention a few more of these programs because I think it's important to convince you that we do have a lot of knowledge that we did not have back in, in 1987 when Rossi devised his iron law of evaluation uh, that these programs work very well. So KIPP, many of you may have heard about, one of our hardest problems is achievement among low-income kids in the public schools. We've made a little progress, but not much. Um, and in fact, in some groups, we've actually lost a little ground. But KIPP schools, which are focused on repetition, clear goals, correct behavior, extra work, and often trying to keep kids out of the influence of their community, uh, have been shown to be extremely successful. Very good random assignment studies, again, that show that we can boost both the achievement of these kids and their college enrollment. Measures like college enrollment are really the kind of measures we want to have because that is a direct measure of success in American society, and I suspect here as well. Kids who enroll in college have changed the whole course of their life. Now, there's still problems. You can still, there are a lot of ways you can mess up, uh, and some of these kids do, and some of them wind up with big debts and so forth. But as a group, 
they are much better off. If we can help kids get to either two-year or four-year college, it's a great success. And KIPP is one of the few programs that's been shown to actually do that. I also want to mention small schools of choice because small schools of choice occur in an inner city uh, in New York, one of the hardest school systems to operate. New York is kind of a country unto itself. Uh, and yet, they created a small schools of choice and the way they there are several elements that take a long time to explain this, and I just want to give you the basic idea. They changed the schools themselves to help the kids focus on certain areas of that they developed expertise. One of them was work and the transition to work. In the old days, we used to call it industrial arts. But the kids learned skills. They learned the math that went with the skills. And a very crucial part of the intervention was that they visited, they had something like a mentor who was employed and had a job, usually a, uh, a white collar job, so they could learn what it was like to work. And they could learn the values of work, that you have to show up regularly, you have to get along with your peers at work, you have to get, learn to take orders and so forth. And you know that the kids were followed for eight years in um, sites all over the United States. And it had no effect on the girls, interestingly, but major effects on the boys. And they were much more likely to be employed. They earned, on average, $2,000 more a year. And get this, they were more likely to be married. And they were more likely to live with their children. So this is a set of outcomes that is extremely rare. And we produced it in one of the most difficult school systems in the country. And we know a lot about it because we studied it carefully. And this was a random assignment design that really indicated uh, that they were, had these impacts and we could be expected to have them again if we run a program, a uh, similar program. So there are a lot of, I could have, as I say, I could have used a lot of other programs here, but these are representative. I hope you are convinced that we know a lot about intervention in, in every area of social policy where we have trouble. So if we're going to increase these programs, and we're going to make them even more effective and learn to generalize them and spread them across the country, which we're going to have to do to be effective. Here, I think, are the essential components of evidence-based policy. So good ideas for social interventions tested by trial and error learning. That's essentially random assignment. We need more evidence of success. We need to constantly evaluate, constantly to learn that this particular approach, at least with this group, in this time and place, has impacts. And then we need to study further about how they can be generalized. But we must continue to develop effective programs. In a word, innovation is crucial. Uh, secondly, uh, high quality evaluations are crucial. I think randomized control trials, I think we have a lot of agreement about this in the United States, are the best single method, but they're not the only one. We should not have a big quarrel as we're having now in the United States about if you have to use random assignment, if you don't have something that's been demonstrated by random assignment, then you don't know that it's true. I think that's a mistake, <clears throat> but a random assignment is the king of the hill. But a lot of other methods work well, and we're going to have to use other methods because we can't afford to do random assignment studies on every dinky little question. Random assignment studies take much longer and so forth. We are changing random assignment studies. There's a real emphasis on shorter duration, Using administrative data, which is an especially important message for this group because you have access to a lot of administrative data. So you, we can do very good random assignment studies without collecting very much new data because a lot of it we're already collecting in, in administrative data sets. This is particularly true in education and particularly true uh, in juvenile delinquency. They already have a lot of data that, uh, and we wouldn't have to increase our data collection very much. Uh, replication. As in all science and all social science is key, we have to show that we can do it again. Just showing it one time isn't enough. We have to do it again, and hopefully we have to do it again with other people in other places, with different staff. So we've got to develop the ways that we can, to use the Obama administration's uh, term, scale these programs. We've got to be able to scale them from one or five or ten to literally hundreds of programs all around the country. Um, I'm going to come back to that because I think it's really important. We also can learn a lot from literature reviews, and we have learned a lot from literature reviews. And this is especially a meta-analysis, that this is a way that we can look at the literature and see what we really do know. They often produce big debates, but over a period of time, literature reviews can show us what we really know, and especially important for people who are designing social programs, what we can do and exactly how to do it. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. I think this is a central part uh, of what we're trying to do here. 
and clearing houses um, are a crucial part of that. Uh, I hope, I, I don't know anything about clearing houses in New Zealand. I wish I had a time before I came here to look, look more and figure it out. But in the U.S. we have developed really, I think, amazing clearing houses. I'll talk more about this in a few minutes. Uh, but clearing houses are a place where we show whether the exact nature of programs that have been tried, and in all the clearing houses, I say we have eight in the United States, they somehow rate how strong the evidence is, how high quality the evidence is. That's a crucial thing to know if you're trying to judge whether the information in the clearing house is correct. So you have a clearing house with information about specific programs that have impacts. These are in different areas. So some are in teen pregnancy, others are in an intervention program called home visiting, and there, some are in delinquency. There are several different types uh, of clearing houses. All eight focus on somewhat different uh, issues. And then you can go and find out what we know, what works, and you can get all kinds of information about the evaluation of the program and the people who are associated with developing the program. Because what, what I have in mind here is this is an essential, initial, early step in program development, is to find out what we already know, find out the programs that already work, and even talk to the people who develop the programs and who have used the programs. And this is, a, I think, a major responsibility for a social agency because they ought to be using programs that are effective and that have good evidence of success. Um, so we also have to continue to fund evaluation. Evaluation is a crucial part of this. You have to continue to evaluate. There's no such thing as finding a model program like Head Start or any other program you can think of and all you have to do is keep building it up. Spend more money on that program, everything's going to work. That's not true. As it grows, we need to constantly evaluate the program, evaluate it in new places, even continue evaluating it in the places where it had been shown to work before. So evaluation and government support and private support of evaluations are really important. Um, next, uh, the administrative agencies have to learn to do all the things that I've talked about here. It's really important that both the congressional and administrative agencies work together to figure out what they should be spending the money on. This is an essential part of something I'm going to talk about in just a minute that I wrote this book about on uh, that was mentioned previously about Obama's evidence-based initiatives. Um, and then we have to have an established procedure for transmitting results of policy reviews to government uh, legislative administrative bodies. I said they have a tremendous responsibility here. We have to figure out good ways to give them the information and how, help them use the information to change policies, to abandon lousy programs and to spend the money on good programs. I've had a lot of experience working with policymakers. I don't know exactly about New Zealand, but I can tell you about the United States. To think the policymakers are going to focus a serious amount of attention on evidence is, I don't think that's going to happen. But they have staff that they trust, and in the United States we have various congressional agencies, Congressional Budget Office, General Accounting Office, Congressional Research Service, and so forth, that Congress does trust, and they listen to these agencies. So that's an example of how we can transmit this information uh, to the legislative bodies, and we can do the same thing with administrative bodies. Uh, and then finally, uh, a, 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 a legislative and executive agencies that focus spending on evidence-based programs. That really is the bottom line. We want to spend our money on programs that work, and the executive branch and the legislative branch is a place where those decisions are made, so they're a crucial part of the process. Um, now I want to talk about why I think it's... I'm happy to be here, because I'm pleased to tell you about what is going on in the United States. I think some of it will uh, translate uh, to New Zealand and to any other country who has the uh, economy and the government to be able to invest and to follow a course of using evidence to improve their social programs. And these are several things that have happened in the United States, all of which could be replicated uh, in New Zealand, and some of which I'm sure already have been replicated uh, in New Zealand, and some, in one case I know, even an original idea came uh, from New Zealand, so that's quite impressive to me. Uh, I first want to talk about Obama's evidence-based initiatives. I'm going to come back and talk about that in more detail. Uh, so just let me say now that that is a really important part of what we've learned to do in the United States, and I'll show you why in just a second. Second, I've talked about clearinghouses. They are an essential ingredient. We've developed eight 
actually nine clearinghouses in the United States because the ninth clearinghouse that I'll talk about in more detail was created by foundations, the Pew Foundation uh, and the MacArthur Foundation, and it includes the information from all eight of the other clearinghouses. So now imagine a, you're an executive, you're in a super room, and you want to find a program that's going to increase, uh, uh, increase kids' development during the preschool years. So many programs that have evidence are in these various uh, clearinghouses, and Pew and MacArthur figured out a way to bring all that evidence together. You can go to one site and you can see what the evidence is. You can read the evidence on the studies. I can't imagine why anybody would want to do this, but you could read all the studies, 10 studies or whatever it is, all the details about these studies. So this is, a, as I said, a very important part, and I think we have we've developed this quite well in the United States, and the nice thing about the Internet is you can get, uh, you can get access to all this stuff. Now I have a real question about the extent to which programs adopted and planned in the United States and the evidence supplies to the United States, whether they'll work in other countries. But I'm sure that there are essential parts of those programs that would translate well to other cultures, um, especially cultures that are very similar to the United States. The third thing is, and this is really an indication, I think, of how serious uh, the U.S. is about it, and evidence-based policy, and then it's Ryan and Murray uh, commission that was just recently passed, was introduced about a year ago. Paul Ryan, for many of you probably already know, he's a Speaker of the House of Representatives. Some people say the second most powerful man after the President in Washington. Uh, and uh, Patty Murray is a very influential and senior senator, um, and she was head of the Budget Committee in the Senate. She and Ryan worked together over a period of years, and they had the idea to have this commission. And the goal is, first of all, I th a very important thing is it brought the term evidence-based and evidence-based policy and it's now covered everywhere. It was uh, covered occasionally before but it brought a lot of attention to the idea and a lot of people said what is evidence-based policy? So that's part of how you build a culture that prominent people talk about it and take actions that are intended to promote uh, that part of the culture. So that's a very good part. But in addition, we have so much information in the federal government, not just from individual experiments, which we also have, but national data, which I know you have here too, on uh, the development of children. We have a lot of information in the Census Bureau, a lot of information on employment in the Labor Department, and nobody has really, uh, it's been infrequent that people have sat back and said, now how could we use this information? Can we use this information to really define our problems more carefully? And can we use this information, especially if it's collected over time and you have data over many years that we can identify our problems and maybe even talk about the things uh, that could be a solution or could be part of a solution. So this commission is going to have 15 months and they're going to give a report and they're going to tell Congress and the administrative branch, here are the things that we should do to maximize our ability to use all of this information that the federal government collects and I think they'll probably talk about state governments too, uh, to better improve policy in America. And Congress will have hearings on it. This is the way we do things in the U.S. It's, a, it, it's not totally effective, but it's a good, a good way to do it. Get a lot of publicity. Policymakers will become familiar with it. All kinds of people will be trying to testify before Congress, so they'll read the report and learn about the report. So this is a part of the building culture. Um, I've already talked about growth of model programs with rigorous evaluation. I showed you examples of those. They're building all the time. I think we have you know, 80 or 90 now and soon we'll have w w many more than that, I believe, because this is continuing to develop. Then a very crucial thing, I don't, I'm not sure that you have an organization like OMB, if you don't, maybe you're fortunate. Office of Management and Budget is right cheek by jaw with the President of the United States, and they run the budget, and policy is budget. So this is a crucial group in Washington, and they are, I've, I've in my, I've been in Washington 30 years. I've never seen any agency more focused on any particular uh, goal and trying to develop something and push it as OMB is on evidence. And they are really in a position to do it because all of the executive agencies, so the Department of Labor, Department of Education, Health and Human Services, and so forth, all of these agencies are not under control of OMB, but OMB has a lot to do with their budget. They can affect their budget. And so OMB has really set an example. They run seminars. They work directly uh, with the people in the agencies. 
And one thing that they've been trying to do is to get the agencies to evaluate their programs. This is really a crime in the United States. We have Peter Arzag, who was the head of OMB and is a, considered a cabinet level position in the, in the presidential administration, a very powerful man. And he was focused on evidence, wanted to expand evidence. He once said publicly that we know about the effects of only 1% of federal spending. Now, I think that number may be somewhat exaggerated. But it gives you an idea that we spend all this money, we have all these wonderful goals and so forth, but in many cases, we don't have the slightest idea of what the impacts are. I'll give you a specific example. Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, we spend $15 billion a year, the ostensible purpose is to improve education for low-income kids. And until recently, we knew virtually nothing. In fact, for many years, we didn't even know how the money was spent. And it didn't have clear goals, we didn't have clear evaluations. So that's an example. OMB is really focused on that issue. They want the Department of Education to evaluate it better. They're constantly pressing the agencies to develop better evaluations, spend more of their budget on evaluations, because we need to know if the programs we're using are effective. So OMB is really important. Uh, then we want to have, this has been recent in the Obama administration, we want to have a chief evaluator in every one of these agencies that I just mentioned, plus other agencies as well, so that they will try to bring as much attention to the issue of evaluation. They will fight to get additional funding for evaluation. They will insist on quality to develop a whole culture within a culture of all the agencies realize how important it is to evaluate their programs, and they spend a lot of time and money evaluating to find out if their programs are working or not. Uh, and then another new addition that's really fascinating. What am I doing on time? I didn't see anybody. Oh, good. Okay. So I'm sorry, y'all. You have to stick with me for another 15 minutes. Um, uh, so the social and behavioral sciences team in the White House is a fascinating new development. And I think I don't know of any agency that has been so successful so quickly. They are conducting what are called behavioral science experiments. I, I'm going to talk about those in a few minutes, so let me just set it aside, but say to you that they have actually conducted these experiments. They're working with government agencies to do crucial things like get people to use two-sided copying rather than one-sided copying. Uh, so they have shown in one year that they can really have an impact on executive agencies throughout the federal government, uh, and they've also uh, influenced how the agencies spend their money. So the social and behavior sciences team is a a whole new uh, idea in government, and so far it's been pretty successful. Then a growth of pay for success programs. I'm going to come back and talk about these, so I'll skip over them here, but just tell you that this is another new essential ingredient uh, in an evidence-based culture, and the U.S. is pursuing it quite a bit. The next uh, same results first. I'm going to come back and talk about that, too. I want to give you, I want to make it concrete about what these elements of the of the evidence-based culture are, so I'm going to come back and talk about that. And then, you can't do anything in Washington without lobbying. I'll bet it's the same here. Uh, but in the U.S., we have very high, highly paid people, very highly skilled people, whose goal in life is to tell members how to vote uh, and also to influence, influence the administration. It's fascinating to watch them in action. And if you don't have lobbying groups that are dedicated to what you want, and are willing to fight for it and have, have the contacts and the experience necessary to do that, you're not going to make much progress. So you would expect if this field of evidence-based policy is growing and the federal government is playing a role that there will be, there'll be, a, there'll be groups that will be lobbying the government continuously to increase the spending on evidence-based program. We saw an example of this with the commission, the Pew, uh, the um, Ryan Murray Commission I just mentioned a minute ago. It was amazing how many groups got out and, and really pressed the Congress to have a vote on it, which is kind of hard nowadays, Congress. There are a lot of things that ought to be voted on that don't get voted on because Congress can't even get to first base. Uh, but th in this case, they not only got to first base, they got all the way home and scored because they created the agency. So these lobbying groups are really important. One of the most important uh, is Results for America. I urge you to Google Results for America. You'd be amazed by the things that they're able to do. They're well-funded. They have really good contacts in both Republican and Democratic uh, former administration and congressional members. Uh, and they're able to put together a team to lobby on issues that is really nonpartisan. 
A lot of organizations claim to be nonpartisan, but Results for America really is. And then finally, you have to have money. Government spends a lot of money, but so do foundations. Especially in America, we have the biggest and richest foundations, and we want them to spend their money on results uh, and on evidence, and they're doing so. I've listed some of those organizations here. So that is a major part as well. So you put all those things together, and we, I think we really are changing the way we do business and social policy in the United States, and there may be some lessons here uh, for New Zealand, but that's up to you to decide. Um, I mentioned these clearinghouses. I wanted to list these here because this is going to be available so you can see what they are. You can Google any of these and go right to the clearinghouse and see exactly what they're doing. And Results First Clearinghouse has all of them. And it's, they must have had brilliant geniuses that figured out how to get all of these eight clearinghouses in one place. And you can access the information from all eight of them uh, from one website. And it's very well explained and easy to use. So clearinghouses are very important. And I want to just say a few words about behavioral economics that I mentioned a minute ago, that the White House has this new unit. And many other organizations are pursuing uh, behavioral economics as well. I mentioned something about the principles of be behavioral economics here. Some of the thinking of behavioral economics is counterintuitive. Uh, we often don't think about people have limited cognitive resources. We're always thinking we can do whatever we want to, and we're brilliant geniuses. Uh, but cognitive resources can be uh, can be overwhelmed, and so it's important, and this is a principle of developing your approach to changing people's behavior, you have to have a clear, succinct message and state it near the beginning. This is especially important in writing letters. Now, I'll bet you some of you are thinking, what? letters, what are you talking about? IRS sends out like a zillion letters a year to try to get people to pay overdue taxes. There's a whole set of techniques for how those letters are written. So for example, one, you, in the first sentence you say, the purpose of this letter is that you are overdue on taxes and here's how much you know. So they know right away. And then the second line ought to be, we have found that Americans think it's important to pay their taxes and they try to figure out ways to keep up with their taxes. So you make a positive, positive message. And the letter has to be short, simple language and so forth. So there's a whole technique about how to do this. And there have been numerous, numerous demonstrations that if you follow these rules, that the letters are more effective. And you get more money, people will pay more uh, against their back, back taxes. But similarly, attention is finite. You have to get to the point and don't waste people's time. And exercising restraint, there are several fascinating experiments that show that if people do something that causes them to use self-discipline and then they have to do a second thing that requires self-discipline, that they do much worse on the second one. It's as if they depleted their ability to, um, to, uh, to have self-control. And then I went into a little detail here. You can uh, find this information about the diagnosis and design of the process of designing these kind of experiments like I was describing to you and it would apply to government. So it's defined, diagnose, design, and test. Test is a crucial part. Almost all the experiments that the administration has done uh, uh, on applying behavioral science principles are random assignment designs. And in the first year, they conducted 15 of these things. One of the wraps against random assignments is it takes too long, costs too much. But they showed that you can do quick, you can do rapid, inexpensive, random assignment designs and good, get good answers to your questions. Uh, and 15 in one year, so that I think that's pretty impressive. I mentioned some examples uh, that I think are really important. I've already mentioned one. Let me mention just one more. It's called Summer Melt. This shows you that it's not just getting people to do two-sided copying that these techniques can be used for. It has been found over the years, and I'll bet you a nickel you have the same thing here in New Zealand. I don't know. That you, especially kids from low-income families have everything arranged to go to post-secondary education, go to a college, two or four year college. And they've got the financing worked out, they know where they're going, they have all kinds of information, they've signed on the dotted line, and they don't show up when fall comes. And so, so that's referred to as summer melt. So these techniques are to send messages to these kids, simple things like this, send messages to them about steps that they should take over the summer. And so they send maybe six messages spaced during the summer now it's time to do this, now it's time to do this. Do uh, you have enough money to get your books? All kinds of questions and so forth. And it has a tremendous impact. It increased in one study by more than 20%, the 
percentage of those only kids who showed up for college. So these kind of techniques have been shown over and over again to be effective. And I'm, I'm, I've never been directly involved in this, but my, my thinking about this is that imagination and innovation and ability to think through these things by bureaucrats who are responsible for these programs is the only limit on what we can figure out how to do better than we're doing now and have major impacts that would improve people's lives. Uh, pay for success I mentioned as well. This is an interesting case I was talking yesterday. I found out getting ready for here that there's an, uh, an economist from New Zealand who's very interested in pay for success, made many fundamental contributions to literature, and he's not satisfied with the way it's done at all. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why in just a second. So pay for success is a method of expanding government funding, crucial nowadays because governments are really pressed, especially in the US. For the first time, we're spending less money on children and families. Uh, as a percentage of the federal fin spending than we have in the past. And that's because we're spending so much money on the elderly, on people like me, on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and then that leads to huge interest, so we're spending more and more on interest. And those things are squeezing out spending uh, in other areas. So this is an important problem uh, that the U.S. has to face up to, and we've got to be more successful. And if we can raise money from other sources, then that will be very helpful. So this is a way to do it. So you have to have a government agency that says, okay, we want better achievement, or let's say we want less special education placement. If you can figure out a program that will reduce special education placement, then we want to work with you. And the second thing is they have to get funders. And so far, a number of uh, private organizations have stepped up, uh, even uh, well-known uh, finance financiers from Wall Street who are often very controversial, as you know, uh, in, um, including, I wrote this down because I always forget. Um, well, I wrote it down, but I can't even find it where I wrote it down. Uh, it's a very famous uh, investment company, uh, and they have put up millions of dollars to engage in these pay-for-success programs. There has to be an intermediate organization, it's kind of like the quarterback, that makes the whole thing go together, and then you have to have an evaluation team. So usually the intermediary has an idea about here's what we're going to do. This is going to be the intervention. The funder puts up money, the government establishes the goals, and then you have an evaluator that's reliable that will evaluate the program, usually using random assignment designs, uh, and then you see if the program has an impact. Here's the great part. If it has an impact, then the government saves money and the investor gets paid. If it does not have an impact, the investor loses the money. Taxpayers did not pay a penny. There are about 50 of these going on in the US and Great Britain. We have no idea whether they're actually going to, you know, they can continue to grow and it will be a big new source of money for government. But think of this. It focuses on all of the ingredients of evidence-based policy. You have to have the evaluation, you have to clear, make the goals very clear, and you have to show that you actually save money. Otherwise, the whole thing doesn't work. By the way, we, the first one that was done was done in Rikers Island with delinquents, and it was a failure, it didn't work, and so uh, the investors paid for it, and it didn't cost government anything. That's a, I don't, I don't think there are any other examples like that, so this is really potentially a wonderful way to go. What's my time like now? Five minutes, okay. Um, I want to mention here, I haven't mentioned this enough, so I wanted to put this on several of my slides, and this is the first time I'm going to stop and talk about it. I'll spend at least a minute saying this. Um, there are challenges for every single one of these methods. I tried to say that to you in the beginning. We have to continue to develop these things. I know there are people in the audience that have been skeptical about several things that I've said, and I'm acknowledging that many of them are correct. And we have a lot of work to do to develop these. Uh, measuring outcomes, costs, and benefits is one of the things. We're, this is an inexact science. We need a lot of work to figure out. We need people to agree that this is the best way to do it so that we have a lot of work to do there. Uh, secondly, in pay for success, we need to know where to place the bet. Take Riker, Rikers Island. They used an intervention called cognitive behavioral therapy. The goal was to get the kids to be less violent because they are violent and they come right back in and they wanted to reduce recidivism and they did violent or theft and so forth. And they were trying to get the kids to do better. And there's a, quite a substantial literature with something like eight random assignment studies that shows that cognitive behavior therapy works. 
But in this case, it didn't work. And there's a very complex explanation about why. Because the way Rikers works, the kids are in and out, in and out, and in and out, so they didn't get the full treatment. I said yesterday to a group uh, um, in Auckland, if you build it, they won't necessarily come. You cannot be sure of that. And you can't be sure that people are going to show up for the treatment. This happens all the time. I know many examples in the United States. They just don't come. You could have the greatest program in the world. If they don't come, it's not going to work. And those kids in Rikers Island did not get the whole treatment, so the thing did not work. And this is, of course, the thing, kind of thing that government f faces all the time, so we have to figure out uh, a way around it. And judging where to place the bet is, how strong is the evidence? Can we really be sure that this is going to produce an impact? And the answer is we never know for sure, yes or no. It's a continuum. And where along that continuum should we go ahead and organize a pay for success study thinking that we are going to be, uh, be successful. Results first. This is one of the things that I'm the most impressed with uh, that the United States has figured out and two foundations figured out. There's very little government money in this. What they are trying to do is to get the states to change the way they do business and incorporate evidence into it. 21 states have joined up and what do they, what do they have to have? They have to have states that are willing to go by the evidence and to do the kind of things that I've been describing to you. So here's what they do. First, they pick an area where they want to have an impact. So teen pregnancy, juvenile delinquency, whatever. Then they make a list of all the programs that the state then has that try to solve that problem. And then they review the evidence that, then you, that those programs work. And the states have done it so far have discovered that most of what they do, there is no evidence that it really works. And so the goal is to get them to change and to use the things like clearinghouses. That's why Results First developed this. That's why Pew developed this clearinghouse, so that people could, government officials making these decisions could use the clearinghouses to decide how much evidence is there that this works or not, and could we find a better program, and should we try to implement a, a new program. Uh, and so that is what their 21 states are now at various stages of doing that. I know for a fact that two states, New Mexico and Mississippi, not necessarily the top candidates you would think of in America for being innovative like this, <coughs> have actually used this method to change their spending. So they've removed spending from some programs that don't work and have no evidence of working, and they're now spending on programs that have stronger evidence of success. So this is potentially a very important uh, approach. As I say, 21 states are doing this. It'd be very interesting now to watch what happens with this. Um, and now at last, let me just say a few things about Obama's tiers and tiered initiatives. And here's the first one. A lot of things that are important are pretty simple. Um, first, you have to spend most of, the, of your money on things that work. And that Obama has spent a lot of time and developed a lot of techniques working with the agencies through the Office of Management and Budget, as I described, to make sure that they're spending your money on the most effective possible programs. This seems very simple, but boy, is it a fight to be able to do it. And the second thing is, we always have to spend some money on innovation. Obama has roughly decided 75% of money will be spent on programs that have strong evidence of success, and 25% will be spent on innovative programs because we always need new ideas and new ways to develop these programs. And then we have to have continuous evaluation. So these are the hallmarks of the Obama evidence-based initiatives. Uh, he was able to get uh, several of these through Congress, uh, six in fact, and for about $7 billion, which is, doesn't sound like much, but in the current circumstances, it, is, it, it, it was a great achievement. And so I've got a slide here that tells you all about what these six are. Teen pregnancy that I mentioned before, uh, home visiting uh, with low-income mothers, uh, a major goal is to reduce abuse and neglect, which your program and many of the programs are successful in doing, and so forth. So these, all these initiatives are going on now, and in fact, they're taking place in over 1,400 locations in the United States. They're all being carefully evaluated. So the beauty of this, to me at least, is that Obama is putting his money where his mouth is. Here's how we do it. These are crucial social, social issues, and we need to learn how to do it better, and here we're doing it. And all the, almost all the evaluations are very high quality. They are just now starting to come out. We're getting a huge batch of information about the teen pregnancy prevention programs. Uh, and let me make one last point about this before I conclude. And that is that 
we know that Rossi is still right in many cases. Most things that we're doing do not work. There are many indications that even 80 or 90 percent of our social programs do not produce the results that we want. So we have to face up to that. That's one of the reasons we have to try to improve it. And I think that we need to work with people who are doing these programs and if they're a failure at first and don't produce the results that they're looking for, we should not remove their funding immediately. We should continue to fund them for at least a year or two as long as they're making changes and trying to figure it out. That really is our challenge. We have to figure it out. We have to have a systematic way to figure it out. We have to know when we're being successful and when we're not, and we have to be willing to innovate and change. Those are really the keys. If we don't do those things, I think that Rossi's law is going to continue to be way more correct than it needs to be. We've come a long way since Rossi's iron law, uh, but we have a long way to go.